Well, I click the thing. I don't mean to use such technical language. Now you're on. All right, there we go. <laughs> it's all about the music. Right. Oh, you <laughs> 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 A school family thing to work on something? No, we had a yard sale. We had a jewelry sale. It's all the stuff out there. Yeah, How did you do with the yard with this? All the, I mean, this place was covered. How did you do? We made $100. Very good. So and everything else that. went to this spot. Very good. And people got treasures there. You they did. They were just delighted. Price was reduced at the end and things moved. Well, what do you want to charge? I said, I want to get rid of it. I, I, mean, the, I wasn't in charge of the yeah. That was a different department. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put the sanitizer in there. Just take what you want. Next week we have the carpet laying. Where are you going to put that carpet? In the top. In the top. In the <laughs> you are officially here. You are officially not here. So, yeah, those two years right. yesterday we were, we were we we because you were going to be so far back. We left you in the 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 back. We left you uh, we went to the Southeastern District Convention uh, on Thursday and Friday, and um, Pastor Bill Harmon was elected uh, as district president. Pastor Harmon has, well, I did not know this, but he has roots at Emmanuel and Gainesville. Oh, yes, and, yes. and Concordia Prep. Yeah. And he went to uh, Baltimore Lutheran Concordia Prep. I had no idea. To some of us, he will always be Billy Harmon. Billy yes. Harmon. All right. Daddy, Daddy had him in class. Yeah, I had him in class. That's right. But uh, he said he wants to come and visit once he gets uh, settled oh, in. Oh. So we'll invite him to come and preach. I also, uh, yesterday, went to, it's a long story, but I went to a dinner with, uh, and Pastor Roy Mack was there. Oh, sure. and, uh, Roy sent his greetings, and he specifically said to say hi to you, Dottie. Do you remember Pastor Mac? Of course. Roy Mac, of course. His son Rick was in my class at Lutheran. Roy is a great teller of stories, and um, he told the story of a wedding that he did here. And, you know, with Roy, you never know uh, about the truth. But uh, uh, was there a, 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 a young lady... Last name was Solomon. Yes. 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 Sorry. And he came and did this service. Do you know, any of you remember this ceremony? Oh, I wasn't there. Oh, yeah. She passed out. Yes. <gasps> yes. She he said married. he completely desecrated the sanct the uh, chancel, the sanctuary, the wedding. Uh, he said she came up and during the service she wasn't feeling well and kind of whispered that she didn't. This is terrible. You just had a wedding. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord that this didn't happen. So she didn't feel well and. Uh, um, you know, he was just keeping an eye on her, and then he whispered to uh, Pastor Mac that she was going to throw up. Before the service, they had moved the baptismal font, unbeknownst to Pastor Mac, so he was worried because, you know, they're rearranging the divine furniture, and he's not the pastor in Gainesville, and maybe people are here. So the font gets moved. She says, I'm going to throw up. 
So he grabs the offering plates, <laughs> and she gave an offering. <laughs> uh, you know, she kind of passed out then and said you know, she needed a drink of water. So one of the bridesmaids ran into the sacristy, got the chalice, the common cup, and uh, gave her water from the... You know, filled it up with the water. Um, so he said, by the time he was done, he had he had uh, you know he had uh, vandalized the entire uh, place. Uh, of course, he tells the story much much more humorous than I did. But, uh, Pastor Mac, he's got to be. His wife passed away within the last six months, I think. Um, he's living in in Florida. But he does uh, food for the poor about well, once every six weeks. He uh, he goes around. I send him, and uh, still very active and on the top of his game. And we heard four, five, six stories like that one <laughs> last night. So anyway, uh, let's uh, let's have a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for all of your good gifts. Uh, we thank you in this Easter season that we continue to be reminded of and to celebrate and to rejoice in the victory of your Son, Jesus Christ, over death. Uh, we pray that you be with us in our Bible class. Lead us by your Holy Spirit. Bless our worship, uh, that we might receive your gifts of forgiveness and life with rejoicing. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so um, we are uh, in Luke chapter 9, and uh, we're really at Luke... 923, but there's a section of three stories that all go together um, in Luke 9, beginning at verse 18, and that's when uh, Jesus asks the disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ of God. Uh, he gets the, the right answer. Uh, Jesus then elaborates on what kind of a Messiah, what kind of a Christ he is, and that's where we're going to start in uh, no, and then he says, so, and here Jesus kind of flips the expectations and says he's going to be rejected, he's going to be killed, and, and then he's going to rise again, which uh, the disciples didn't understand. And, and where we're going to pick up, where we left off, is if this is true that Jesus is the Messiah, if it's true this is the kind of Messiah he is, a suffering servant, then what does that mean for his followers? What uh, kind of life then uh, do they, they lead if if Jesus isn't a a continuously victorious sort of uh, uh, glorious uh, Christ while he is on earth? What does that mean for us? So that's where we are, verse twenty three through uh, twenty seven. So let's read. We'll read that. And he said to all, "If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross." daily and follow me for whoever would save his life will lose it but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it for what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself for whoever is ashamed of me and of my words of him will the son of man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the father and of the holy angels but i tell you truly there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. So, what is, uh, as you hear that, what, what kind of answer does Jesus give? What kind of followers does, uh, does Jesus want, or what kind of followers does Jesus have, um, according to these, these words, these verses? Well, from the words of saying to take up our crosses daily, um, it would seem consistent. Consistent. It's what? Consistent. Yeah. Yes. So he says, for, you know, that if he's going to be crucified, we are also going to be cross bearers. And you're right. He says daily, which would be consistently. That's right. So I guess the question is, what does it mean for us as Christians to bear a cross? Um, how does that, what does that look like in our daily life? Does it mean that we wear a cross or we bear a cross? Not to live in the world. Strive 
not to live in the world, which gets harder and harder. Well, actually, it gets easier and easier, but it's becoming more and more bizarre. Yeah, right. 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 So not uh, it's like that, uh, you know, not living. We kind of do live in, in the, the world, world but, but not not of it. Right. Yes. That's the, the phrase. So to be different, to be transformed, right? To yes, I think that's part of it. Absolutely. What other? What does it mean when you hear him say, "Take up your cross and follow me"? So with spirituality, the cross that we're going through. Yes. Um, they talk about that. And it was interesting to me, it's that it's what's done to us. So not our choice of the hard things that we go through. I can choose to do hard things. That's not what this is. This is the things that are, are allowed to happen to us right. that, are, that are hard. Um, yeah. So you have a hard job. You chose your job, maybe, but the job is hard. Um, and then what you do with that card is is what our witness is. Yes, right. So to endure suffering, right? I mean, right. Yes. So uh, bearing a cross is not uh, easy. I think the idea of crucifixion and to in daily uh, to en to endure suffering, not chosen suffering, but that which God allows to happen. Uh, in the world. Yeah, because you could go, you could have a martyr attitude with, oh yes. my gosh, these dishes never end, in my case, laundry. Um, you know, right, 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 right. Yeah, okay, it's, you know, yes. it's sort of done to me, but it's my choice to have as many clothes as I have, and, you know, right. that's that's not really it. Yes, I think that's right. That's exactly right. Um, so, um, I think that with that, you know, enduring suffering is the idea that it's not, you know, continual um, joy and happiness. We, we might sometimes get the idea or the expectation that if we're Christians, then, you know, Jesus did all of these things for us and forgave our sins. And so, you know, then we ought to have a happy, easy life. And Jesus is saying, no, you know. You follow me, so that if I am the kind of a Christ who suffers, dies, and then rises, right, that that our road too would involve suffering, wearing a cross, um, with the expectation of um, uh, eternity, eternal life. But that in this life we we walk in the in the footsteps of, of Jesus, and we endure that suffering, which means involves, I think this is another way of saying that we, we live by faith and not by sight, right? Um, we don't have everything now. We believe we will have everything, and we will have everything, but we don't have it just yet, which is part of uh, wearing the cross. Did I say a hand? Yes, yes. Um, what about like, loving our enemies, the people that are Yes, that's good. Um, loving our enemies. So Jesus on the cross... You know, Father, forgive them, even as he was being uh, put to death. Yes, and so loving your enemies is, is a part of bearing your cross, even when they are doing evil, when they're doing wrong, yet still seeking to forgive them and love them is a part of bearing the cross, for sure. Yes, Kate. Well, and also Christ, remembering Christ's suffering that way is a way of remembering his sacrifice for us. That's right. Yeah. You know, as we're going through suffering, one, it's generally not as bad as what he went through, and and two, he didn't even do it for himself; he did it for us. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So remembering it, yeah, and so our daily sufferings. Then, that's one way in which, as we're suffering, God uses those sufferings, even to benefit us, um, in the. If we look at them as a cross, then we're reminded that Jesus wore the ultimate, actually was sacrificed, crucified for us, so that our sufferings turn us back to, to Jesus. Yes. I was going to say uh, selflessness. Yes. We should not put ourselves first, but look for uh, helping others. That's right. 
Yeah, and I have I have that down as well. So I think there's um, and all of what you guys have said is, is right, and, and I think there's three three parts of this that we might highlight, and, I, and the one is what you just said, Roy, and that part of cross bearing if, if is denying self for the benefit of others, because Jesus goes on to say. Um, probably have this on a PowerPoint. Um, I, I do. Maybe not. Uh, say, you, can, you can even read this uh, better than mine. So deny self for the benefit of others, put self to death, uh, repentance. So Jesus says here, uh, whoever would save his life, verse 24, will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. So losing your life is another way of saving, giving your life away for the benefit of others. If we think about what Jesus did on the cross, he did exactly that. He denied himself for the benefit of others. The benefit was for us, right? He did not, in the words of Philippians, count equality with God something to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, death, even death on the cross, you know, for us, right? And so if we are following Jesus and if we're wearing our cross, then we're not going to literally be crucified. I mean, we may, if we live in a certain time and place where that's up. There have been Christians that have been crucified. But we will deny ourselves daily uh, for the benefit of others. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing in us. The Holy Spirit isn't necessarily... Um, the Holy Spirit does, and God does bless us with wonderful things, with happiness and blessings. But what the Holy Spirit is also doing is allowing suffering, allowing things, and moving us not to be more involved in ourselves, but wearing a cross means denying uh, ourselves for the benefit of others, which is the pattern of the cross. Right. Yes, Irene. And I think under that comes to help bear one another's burdens. Yes. The time that we, you know, for us, listening to somebody else, you know, take, making, you know, taking somebody a meal, going out of your way to do something to help them yes. at a time when they have such a great need because they have a big cross to bear. Yeah. So you're that's right. And that's the pattern, right? You're sacrificing yourself. You know, you could, instead of making that meal, delivering it, instead of listening to someone or whatever, you're denying yourself. And so instead of, you know, sitting on the couch <laughs> or, take, you know, having some nice experience, you are putting yourself... Out, you're sacrificing your time, your energy, your attention for the sake of someone else. And that's a form of wearing your cross. Right. Denying self for the benefit of others. Yes. I was also going to say, unless I missed it before I got here, I mean, part of it is we should also expect that at least at times, right, we're going to be ridiculed and thought of as a fool, thought of as a bigot, and yeah. all that if we... Yes. And, and but again, Christ, the same thing, you know. Right. He helped others, he can't even help himself. Yes. You know, so we should ex expect some of that also. Right, I think so. So then Part number two, suffering. wear a cross and door suffering. Uh, suffering both in a generic sense, I think, where just God allows suffering in our life in order to um, uh, mortify our passions. I like talking that way. Uh, to put our old self to death, right? So he allows suffering, pain, whether it's physical sickness or, or just bad stuff in our life. He's doesn't doing it to put our old self to death so that we trust and have faith in him. We confess our sins, repent, but also endure suffering specifically for being a Christian. In fact, some people inter say, some Lutheran interpreters say that you know, bear, wearing your cross really is only that suffering you endure specifically for being a Christian, not... Suffering, which is common to all humanity, meaning, you know, if you have cancer or trouble in your family. Some people say that bearing a cross really is um, specifically Christian. I, don't, I, I think it can be more broad, but yes, it's, it's part of that. Exactly right. And then finally, trust in God. In other words, when you do endure suffering, whether you're enduring it for being a Christian or, or just general suffering or when you are sacrificing yourself in the midst of it, to trust God. And when there is difficulty, well, again, the pattern is Christ. What, what the Holy Spirit does is the Christian life is cruciform, uh, meaning 
our life begins to look like Jesus' life. And so what Jesus did on the cross was he put his faith in his Father. Right? Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So we, what God is doing to us is, is where he's, he's trying to put away our self-faith, our trust in self, which is idolatry, and that we would trust in him uh, in the midst of these uh, things. And that's a, a cross life, right? Um, so there, here are some passages which kind of go with this, which is the, uh, more the idea of mortifying yourself. When, when you wear a cross, right, when Jesus was crucified, he died, and he rose. So one thing that God is doing, Christ is doing, when we wear a cross, the Holy Spirit is doing, is he's putting us to death. That's under this denying self. Wearing, being, uh, uh, taking up your cross and following Christ means being put to death. Right? That's what crucifixion is. Not literally. Again, maybe. Uh, God forbid, but maybe. But spiritually, we're being put to death. So here it says, uh, I don't remember what chapter this is, but um, 2 Timothy, remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. But the word of God is not bound, therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The saying is trustworthy, and here you say, if we have died with him, we will also live with him. So we die daily, right? We put ourselves to death through repentance, right? And if we're not willing to repent, God's going to push that cross down on us, right? Uh, mortify us so that we do repent, right? If we have died with him, we live with him. If we endure, we will reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. So this kind of fits in with... Uh, this same passage in Luke where he says, Whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory. So, um, so putting yourself to death. Galatians 2, Paul saying, I have been crucified with Christ. We wearing a cross. Again, not literally. Paul didn't die on a cross. And it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. Trust in God, in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So our old self is continually being put to death, right? Repentance, confession, the sin in us is being put to death, and the new life is continually being risen up, which is, of course, baptism uh, with Romans 6. Been baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death. We were buried with him by baptism into death. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So baptism is going down under the water, dying, your old self, and rising up, resurrection, new self. Um, and this is, talks about the body of sin might be brought to nothing, verse 6, that's dying and rising again. So wearing a cross is death, resurrection daily, um, and uh, living then for others, not for self. Questions or comments about that? Now, the word daily, I think, is the tough part. Yeah. You know, I'm not exactly suffering when I go into work, but, you know, you, you look at the, I hate to use the word idiocy or lunacy that you see. Um, I, you know, Jesus worked with some kind of idiotic people, too, you know. Right. So, uh, the word daily, that's second in difficulty only loving your enemies is going in every day and you know hearing the same things listening to the same bloviations and you know it's it's a challenge right and you know, by the end of the day <laughs> it's a model you know and it's, uh, it's a kind of tough yes well that's one form of suffering right <laughs> what's that uh <laughs> I don't know who said this. Uh, one of, uh, but um, um, hell is other people. <laughs> that was, uh, well, I think, I don't know who it was. It was a philosopher. Hell is other people. So, and we might say as Christians, hell is other sinful people, right? 
Hell is also us as sinful people, right? I mean, they might be bloviating. We might be bloviating too, and they may have the very same feeling of coming to work when they see us as, as when we see them. But yeah. Any other questions on that? Uh, verse 27 is uh, uh, a little bit of a puzzle. Um, verse 27 says, I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. So people have puzzled over figuring that out. Um, what you know? What is uh, you know? What does Jesus mean? And what event? How did that come come to pass? Right? I think there are three answers. Um, number one, that uh, it refers to the return of Christ. That there are some in the in his hearing that will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Meaning. They will not taste death until Jesus returns and the kingdom comes and the end of the world. Well, uh, everybody who is standing around there listening to Jesus died, so that kind of eliminates that as a possibility. Some people say that's what Jesus meant, and it turned out wrong. Uh, we're not going to go down that path. path. The other two possibilities are the next story uh, in the Luke's Gospel, the next story that happens is the Transfiguration in which three of those disciples that are there listening to Jesus, Peter, James, and John, go up onto the mountain, and in effect, they see the kingdom of God. They see uh, eternity, in a sense. We're going to talk about the transfiguration. They see Moses and Elijah in glory, the saints. They see Jesus in glory. They are there with them. The voice comes from the cloud, the Father. And so they have, it's a preview uh, of the resurrection. So, Perhaps that's what Jesus meant. Uh, the third possibility uh, is, the, is the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus himself. So that some there will not taste death until they see the kingdom, meaning that Jesus is going to die and rise again, and he's going to appear to his disciples, and that really is uh, the coming of the kingdom. I think any of those last two, I mean, is, is an okay interpretation, I think. You know, uh, I was going back to uh, Babel when everybody spoke the same language for a while and then that didn't work out so well, so God said, you're not going to speak the same right. language. But right. then when the uh, um, apostles received the Holy Spirit, everybody was able to understand yeah. that we're in the kingdom of God, we won't have this separation. Mm -hmm. you know, that could be another symbol of, oh, sure. that, you know, we'll all be able to understand each other. And that was an example that people were mesmerized by the fact that people... They don't speak my language, but yet I'm understanding. Yeah, right. And the kingdom has come. Right. And the kingdom has come. Right. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, let's tackle the transfiguration. Uh, there's a, my art class for the day, but uh, let's read it. It's a really uh, an amazing passage with a whole lot going on. But uh, first, we have to read it. So Luke 9, 28 and following. Now about eight days after these sayings, he took with him Peter, John, and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men, and as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah not knowing what he said. And as he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. So, uh, this uh, 
um, painting, which is uh, Raphael, or the, I think it's the last thing that he painted. Anyway, there's Jesus. Again, the light. If you, you know, same with the uh, Christmas uh, paintings. The light is always coming from Jesus. So there's Jesus. Uh, Moses and Elijah. You see Moses with the tablets of the law there. Uh, there are the disciples being overwhelmed by the glory. Um, what's interesting is the next story, which we haven't gotten to yet, uh, is Jesus heals a boy with an unclean spirit. For whatever reason, the, the painter puts about two-thirds of this uh, story with the, there's the guy with the unclean spirit, and uh, the disciples are unable to heal him as the story goes. And so you get this contrast, the divine, glorious Jesus and the demonic, sort of sinful world down here below. So, interesting. Um, so, there's so much going on here. We're just going to go down this list and, and consider all the different aspects of this story, right? So it starts off in 9, verse 28, uh, where it says, Now about eight days... After these sayings, he took with him Peter and John and James, and he went up on the mountain to pray. So in Luke's gospel, uh, often, I mean, Jesus is said to pray many times, much more often than in the other gospels. And it also um, tends to happen uh, right before significant events in the gospel. So right before the Sermon on the Plain, where he, he gives the Beatitudes and everything, uh, Jesus was praying. Um, he's going to be praying in the Garden of Gethsemane uh, right before his crucifixion. And so here, he goes up on the mountain, he's praying, and, and it kind of uh, introduces this uh, magnificent scene of the transfiguration. The, the second thing is um, Jesus is on a mountain. And so as you think about the Bible and Bible stories, what other significant events happened on Mountains. What happens in mountains in the Bible? What are some other important things? The Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, which is Mount what? Sinai. Mount Sinai. That's right. The Ten Commandments, the giving of the law, um, is the big one, right? Uh, what other mountains? I remember some pastor doing a Lenten service series. Well, the mountains of Lent, but I can never think of what the five mountains were. Um, uh, Mount Sinai, of course, Jesus. What happens in Jesus' life other than, so this is the Mount of Transfiguration. What else happens on a mountain? Uh, the sacrifice of, well, the, the possible sacrifice of Isaac. Yeah, that's right. Sermon on the Mount. What's that? Sermon on the Mount. Yes, very good. The Sermon on the Mount. We'll, we'll call that two ways since I've already. Um, Sermon on the Mount. Very good. Yes. The sacrifice of Isaac. I'm trying to remember. I guess that doesn't happen on Sinai. I don't remember. It might be more Moriah. I don't remember. The devil takes Jesus up to the mountain in the temptation. Oh, on the very top. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it takes him up to the. Yeah, that's good. And of course, Jesus is crucified on a, on a hill, um, but uh, also a mountain. Uh, in, in the Holy Land, mountains aren't that big. Uh, but he, he goes up on, a, on a, um, Calvary. To be the Ark. What's that? Is that like the Ark? Yeah, I went oh, settled on Mount Ararat. 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 Yes. That's good. And. And on that, you know, the, the ark settled there, and, and uh, there was uh, uh, some significant things that happened there at the end of the flood with the dove and the restoration and the promise on the, in the boat. That's right. Uh, Mount, is it Mount Carmel, where the yeah. prophets of Baal were all. Yeah, very good. See, we're getting it. Next year I'll do the, the, the mountains of what? Yeah, caramel. And, uh, that's uh, what I put in my coffee. Mount Carmel. Yeah, where and God and that's interesting. I hadn't thought of that because there's also fire on that mountain, right? I mean, Elijah calls down fire on the prophets of Baal, and they are consumed. And we're going to get there's 
Yes, yes, that's right. We saved them all. We also all. see the burning bush on the mountain. Mount Olive, Mount of Olives, that's yeah, good too. He says, uh, that's right. Um, enters in Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives, and I believe in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's around, I don't know if he's on Mount of Olives, but he's around the Mount of Olives, so that's right. What did you say? Ooh. Was the burning bush on the mountain? It was at the base of the mountain. It was at the base of Mount Sinai. Um, the burning bush. That's good. Um, Mount Zion. Mount Zion? Oh, yes. Says, yeah. uh, captured Martin. by David and becomes the city of David's kingdom. Yeah, Mount Zion. It's a, exactly right. Which is Mount she's Zion. Cheating. She's cheating. I am cheating. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm not ashamed of that. Everybody's Googling Mount Zion. I'm not ashamed of that. So Mount Zion, that's exactly right, which is where the city of Jerusalem is built on, and the temple, really, well, the Jerusalem surrounds, but Mount Zion is the mountain which the temple, and Mount Zion becomes in the scriptures a shorthand for, uh, you know, the people of God, really, right? I mean, uh, daughter of Zion, uh, and so Zion becomes shorthand for the temple, it becomes shorthand for Jerusalem, and it really becomes shorthand for the people themselves. And then in the whole scope of the Bible, it becomes shorthand or a, a picture of heaven. Well, it will all be gathered back you know, on Mount Zion. So mountains in the old, in, in, in many religions, is the place where, you know, in Greek mythology, Mount Olympus is where the gods live. So, you know, mountains are thought of, you know, as halfway in between heaven and earth. So... You go up on the mountain and you and you know you meet the gods there and and that this is the mountain really all of these I think not every single one of them but uh, you know the transfiguration um, is in Sinai what happens on Mount Sinai um, really go together I think uh, Zion is also involved in all the rest um, so uh, but the fact that it is on a mountain uh, is significant. So, uh, the next thing I have down here is uh, the, mo, uh, Jesus' face is altered. Uh, I misspelled dazzling. His clothing is, uh, is dazzling white. So, let's just, I think a lot of this, um, uh, this and Sinai and glory uh, are, let's look at some passages from Mount Sinai, from the giving of the law, and you can see how it connects up with uh, the transfiguration. So this is Exodus 19. Um, you know, the people of Israel, I could do my all-purpose map, but they, okay, I will. Um, uh, they, um, they come out from Egypt, and um, Mount Sinai is down. Um, There's uh, the, uh, the river, the Nile River, and so Egypt, slavery, they come out, uh, Passover, Red Sea, and then the whole, what, what Moses had been telling Pharaoh is that he wanted to take his people out into the wilderness uh, so they could worship God, right? So they go out, and the whole first leg of the trip is, is for at to Mount Sinai, and so they finally made it. They've already started grumbling on the way to Mount Sinai. But they make it to Mount Sinai, and this is where God is going to meet with them on Mount Sinai. So here, they've arrived. Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. All the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you and may also believe you forever. And so right away, ding, 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 a uh, cloud, right? Because at the end of the transfiguration story, as he was saying these things, this is verse 34, a cloud came and overshadowed them and they were afraid and a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my son, my chosen one, listen to him. So, here in the on Sinai, God, the Lord, came to Moses in a cloud to speak with him. 
right? The people may hear when I speak with you, and they also believe you forever. And so on Mount Sinai, you have the Lord speaking to Moses, right? And so in this little, in, in what, on, our, on, on Transfiguration, um, the Lord God says, and, and so here, the idea is the Lord speaks to Moses, and Moses speaks to the people, right? Uh, the, the people don't go all the way up on the mountain. In fact, God tells them not to, and Moses keeps them down. It's just Moses and the Lord on the top of the mountain. And so the Lord speaks to Moses, and Moses speaks to the people. And here, we're just going to jump around. Right? So here it says, verse 35, a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. So what happens on the Mount of Transfiguration is that Jesus is the new Moses, the better Moses, the higher Moses. And really in the end on the Mount of Transfiguration, the, what, the, what the story is, what the lesson is, is that on Mount Sinai, the Lord spoke to Moses, right? Um, on the Mount of Transfiguration, um, the Lord doesn't speak to Moses, but Jesus replaces Moses. So on the Mount of Transfiguration, it's Jesus, right? It's not the Lord anymore. We don't need Moses. Uh, it's Jesus. Listen to him. And when those words were done, it says, when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. Moses has disappeared. Elijah has disappeared. It's only Jesus. And so on the top of the mountain, it's now the voice of Jesus, which is, determined to Moses and Elijah are fulfilled uh, in him. Does that make sense? Um, so let's look at some more. Right? On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud again on a mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. So the Lord has come down and is now present on the mountain. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. So on Mount Sinai, God is present in an overwhelming way. On the Mount of Transfiguration, God is present in the person of Jesus. Because the person of Jesus now, here there's fire and smoke and all the rest, but the glory of God is now shining and is present in the person, the flesh and blood person of Jesus. And he, as it says in verse 29, his face was altered and his clothes became dazzling white. And so the glory of God, the presence of God, on Mount Sinai um, is, is here in the descent of the Lord. On the Mount of Transfiguration, it's in Jesus. Jesus is the Lord, the presence of God. And again, so uh, does that make sense? Because on the mountain of Sinai, the Lord speaks to Moses. And here on the Mount of Transfiguration, the Lord, Moses is again talking on the top of the mountain but he's not talking to God in the cloud or anywhere else. He's talking to God in the person of Jesus, right? And behold, two men were talking with him, verse 30, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure. So a large part of transfiguration is um, uh, this Moses-Jesus sort of comparison typology and the fact that Jesus is greater than Moses, and Jesus is, in fact, uh, God. Here is uh, let's just skip down to here. Um, there's a lot here. Uh, Moses went up on the mountain, and again, third time we've seen it, the cloud covered the mountain. The glory, and this got cut off, the glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. On the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord 
was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. So here, the glory of the Lord is like a, a devouring fire. Uh, and the glory of the Lord appears to Moses. Here we see that it also says in verse 31, Moses and Elijah appeared in glory and spoke uh, with him about his departure. Uh, the word glory um, in the Old Testament is really equivalent <laughs> to the presence of God. So here when it says that uh, uh, the glory of the Lord, the Lord dwelt, the appearance of the glory of the Lord, glory is shorthand for God's presence. Um, and so in the old, in here in, on Mount Sinai, the glory comes down. On Mount the Transfiguration, the glory of the Lord is inside and through Jesus. The presence of God is Jesus. The Transfiguration is really just a visual confirmation of what John chapter 1, verse 14 says. Um, the Word was made flesh. In the beginning was the Word. The word, was, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. glory. Right? We have seen his glory. Here, the disciples, three of them, see his glory. And it just doesn't mean that he's shiny. Uh, it means that uh, the presence of the Lord is in Christ. Right? Um, just as the glory of the Lord came down on Mount Sinai, now it has come down on the transfiguration. Uh, but it's, it's Jesus. Um, this is the shining face of Moses. And again, this is this uh, comparison between Jesus and Moses and how Jesus is in every case greater than and the fulfillment of everything that Moses was So here when Moses came down He was face to face with God and the glory of God shone on his face and it reflected on his face So that when Moses came down, he had to cover his face with a veil, right? Um, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God right so Moses when he comes down from the mountain, reflects the glory of God. And his face is shiny. Jesus' face is shiny also. As it says, the appearance of his face was altered, his clothing became dazzling white. But Jesus' face, Moses, it wears off, right? Uh, he wears the veil for a certain amount of time. When he comes down, you know, it, it, here he puts the veil over because the glory was overwhelmed. But again, Jesus doesn't have the glory of God because... It's reflecting glory. He has the glory because he is the very Lord God, and the glory comes from within him. Jesus isn't shining a flashlight, right? It's his divine nature which is shining in and through him. So again, Moses shone. Moses had the glory of God, but it was reflected glory. But Jesus has the glory of God because of who he is. Right? Questions about that? I don't know it wasn't... Uh, most organized sort of something. But it's that Moses, Jesus typology. Moses and Elijah. Moses is the lawgiver. What is Elijah? Why is Elijah up there? Um, because of Mo uh, Moses, of course, is all of these Sinai, the giving of the law, Old Testament. Elijah is, is a prophet, right? So you have the law, Moses, and the prophets, Elijah. Right? And so both of them are up there speaking with Jesus. Right? Jesus is talking to them. And again, Jesus here is the Lord. He's God. In the Old Testament, Moses talked to God on the mountain. Now Moses is talking with Jesus. Elijah, as the prophet, received the word from the Lord and gave that word out. Now Elijah is talking to Jesus. He is, he is the Lord himself. He is God. And they are speaking to him. And again, once that cloud comes, the cloud says, listen to Jesus. And Moses and Elijah disappear. So everything that Moses was in the Old Testament, Jesus now is. Everything that Elijah and the prophets were in the Old Testament now is in the person of Jesus, the law and the prophets. The other thing that this is a, a vision of is, of course, um, is heaven, right? Um, uh, they appear in glory. Moses and Elijah are sharing the glory of God. It says in verse 31, Moses and Elijah who appeared in glory. And so 
Moses died. Um, these are two dead people. Elijah never died, right? He got taken up by the chariot. Uh, we presume that the chariot took him to heaven, right? So you have two citizens of heaven, two people who have departed this life. Moses, who died, although nobody ever knew where he was buried because the Lord buried him. But Moses died. Elijah went to heaven. And now here they are, uh, appearing with God, with Jesus in glory. And you also have on this mountain um, people who haven't departed yet. So you have, you have Jesus, you have Moses and Elijah, and then you also have the three disciples, Peter, James, and John. Uh, here, Peter, James, and John, right? And the whole scene is filled with the glory of God. And so this is a promise this is a vision of all the saints, the church, right? Jesus, the people who have gone before us to heaven, and us. We're still, we're still, Peter, James, and John are not there yet. They're going to have to go down the mountain and continue wearing their cross and suffering until they get translated to glory. And so this is a picture of, and a promise that we, we're down here right now, Peter, James, and John, but we're going to have this. And so it's it's a picture of eternity and it's a picture of the church. Both the church triumphant, Moses and Elijah, and the church militant, the church that's still traveling on, but all on the mountain together. Right? Um, which is what happens in church. Right? In church, Jesus appears uh, among us, uh, his glory. We say in the liturgy with the angels and the archangels, and all the company of heaven. When we gather in worship, we hear his word, the two or three are gathered, uh, we're in the presence of Jesus. There's only one Jesus, so the saints in glory are also in the presence of Jesus. The Bible says, as this story tells us, that uh, those who have gone before us, where are they? Well, they're with Christ. Well, who are we with when we go to church? Uh, in a special way, we're with Christ. So, in a certain sense, um, uh, our worship service, the liturgy, especially when we go to the sacrament, is a, um, is a fulfillment or a picture also of the transfiguration. Um, questions about all that? Um, I'm about to launch into a transfiguration sermon. So, um, uh, let's look at my list because I kind of forgot what I was going to say. Um, Glory of the presence of God. Here's a, this next little thing again. It's such an amazing story. So, verse 30. Behold, two men were talking with him. Moses and Elijah appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now, if you have an ESV Bible, you have a little footnote with the word departure. Do you see that? A little number one? Is that in your Bible? Or you guys are all looking at your phone, aren't you? Uh so this little uh, footnote says, uh, in Greek, the word departure is exodus. And again, we all shake our fingers at the ESV translators and say, you should have put the word exodus in there because it has all kinds of echoes and connections in the Bible, doesn't it? It's not, they're not just talking about his departure, like he's getting in a car and going somewhere. Behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his exodus, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now, what happens at Jerusalem is that Jesus is going to be betrayed into the hands of sinful men. He's going to be put to death. He's going to die. He's going to be buried. And he's going to rise again. And eventually, he's going to ascend and go to heaven, right? Back to heaven. And so that's his, his departure means his departure from this world. But the word is exodus. It's a biblical word. The word is the name of the second book of the Bible, Exodus, which means that what Jesus is doing is the very same thing that God did with the people of Israel. He took them out of Egypt, the place of slavery and death, took them through the wilderness where they suffered, and into the promised land. Jesus, by his death, resurrection, and ascension, is going out of this sinful world, overcoming death, right? He's leaving this world of sinful death through his suffering to the promised land of heaven. That's his exodus. He's retracing the steps of the children of Israel's exodus 
right, to the promised land. And when he just told every, he just told the disciples, if anybody wants to come after me, he must take up his cross and follow me. Well, we are walking on the path of Exodus. We're following Jesus, right? This map, which I've covered up with scribbling, right? We go through Egypt, through the baptism of the Red Sea, into the promised land. We are making our Exodus and following Jesus, right? Um, so it's much more than just his departure. It is, it's, it's his exodus. He's fulfilling, he's redoing what happened to the Old Testament people of Israel. Uh, and that's the pattern then. You know, the pattern is this exodus, wilderness, promised land. And it's the same pattern that we live uh, today in our life when we follow Christ. All right. Real quick, so we can say we finished this. Uh, why did Peter want to build tents? Why why couldn't he build tents? Why was that a foolish thing to do? Anybody? Well, it was because Jesus wasn't going to stay there. He yeah. was going to go out and fulfill his mission. Yeah, that's right. They have to go back down. Um, being a Christian um, isn't Disneyland. We don't go to the top of the mountain, stay there, right? Have a vacation, camp out. They have to go back down the mountain um, and then go on to Jerusalem, right? Um, it's the old saying, uh, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die, right? So you have to go down from the mountain um, and follow Jesus on the road of suffering. And you can't just stay on the mountain. Yes. We covered that. Listen to him and Jesus alone. Yeah. Any questions on uh, transfiguration? Well, oh boy, we did it. All right. We'll see you in church. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>